Our passage comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 1 through 3. You can follow along on the Pew Bibles or on the screens. That'll be there in this translation. Let's hear the Word of God together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight and the sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race set out for us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set out for him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Think of him who endured such opposition against himself by sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls and give up. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God said, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. We have been doing a really quick series Uh, kind of overview through the book of Hebrews over the last three weeks. And this is our concluding week. Next week, there's going to be a special kind of Thanksgiving message. Amber Hoker, our director of Connectional Ministry and Congregational Care, will be preaching. Uh, And then we start Advent. So we're just a few weeks away from the season of anticipation, of expectation for what God wants to do through Advent into Christmas. And so we are grateful for this time in the book of Hebrews. It's a powerful text. We've been unpacking it each week as we've gathered together, recognizing that this is a text that was written to probably a Jewish Christian community in the first century sometime. They were undergoing some difficult challenges, some persecution, and all of these things were creating all of these default modes of, uh, of behavior where this Christian community was going back to some of their Jewish practices, taking the law and making the law a higher and more important reality than Jesus himself, looking at Moses as a prophet that is a greater than Jesus. And so the author of Hebrews is, is really debating and, and helping them shift their perspective by seeing that Jesus is greater than literally everything. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is the greatest high priest. He's the greater sacrifice. And in Jesus is the greater covenant in the new covenant. And we get to this chapter 12, probably the most famous or well-known verse of the entire book of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus the founder, the author, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. This passage starts with the word therefore. And as much as it feels cheesy, anytime you come across the word therefore in the Bible, you should go back and say, what's the therefore there for? And so if you go back just one chapter into chapter 11, there's this whole conversation that the author of Hebrews is having with this early church And he's telling them, or they're telling them, these 16 different characters from the Old Testament. He's talking about their faithfulness. And and the, the, the specific premise of almost every single one of these stories of these Old Testament characters is that these men and women had faith even though they didn't get to see Jesus the way that we have seen Jesus. These men and women stood in the midst of incredible challenges. Yet, they only knew in part what we know almost in full. You see, what we believe is that through Jesus Christ, we have this image of who God the Father is. His heart for us, that in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has been inaugurated, and we have this new king that leads our world and our way of being. And and yet, at the same time, we recognize we live in a world that doesn't always look like the kingdom of heaven. That we live in a place where Jesus doesn't always seem to be king when they turn on the night news or any other things. But the truth that we believe as followers of Jesus is that our entire lives are towards the kingdom of heaven, which is coexisting at this point with all of the other kingdoms. But there will be a day when the kingdom of heaven will fully take over the earth. And on that day, Jesus will sit upon the throne. And until then, we have to live in the now and not yet of the kingdom of heaven. And so the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 says, look at all of these people, Abraham and David and Samuel and all of these characters that you know from all of the stories you might have learned in kids' ministry. And he's saying they stood by in faithfulness, even without Jesus. And then he he looks at you and he looks at me and he looks at this early church 
And he says, I know that this is a hard season for you. I know that there are challenges. I know that you're being persecuted and, and families abandoning you. You have friends that have been your friends, but because you've shifted and now you profess Jesus Christ as Lord, maybe they've left you and they don't want to talk to you anymore. He says, I know things are hard, but don't forget that you are not on your own in this journey. And, and the first collection of people that the author of Hebrews wants you and I to know is standing there with us is this great cloud of witnesses. This great cloud of witnesses, it's all of the people of faith who've gone before us and are now are in this giant cheering section and they're applauding you and challenging you and pushing you saying, keep going, keep going. No matter what happens, keep moving forward because you're not alone. You have this incredible cloud of witnesses. And, and the author is making the direct connection to the 16 characters from chapter 11. So you have Abraham and Moses and Jacob and Joshua, and they're up here in this, and the imagery is exactly that. Like the imagery that was used in Hebrews chapter 12 that we see here that we read is the story of runners who would come from a distance, a long marathon run, and, and then as they were moving into some sort of amphitheater was the finish line, they would hear the roar of the crowd encouraging and challenging them to finish the race well. And I want you to know, friends, that we are a part of that. Is this great cloud of witnesses. And what I believe in my understanding of this text is all of the people of faith that meant something to us, that shaped us, that formed us, who have passed on from this life to the next, they've joined that great cloud of witnesses. How incredible is it that your grandfather, who modeled faith for you, your uncle, your Sunday school teacher, whomever it was in your life that, that was Jesus shining bright into your life is, is there up there saying, keep going. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Is knowing that Jesus is with us, knowing that it takes faith for us, for us to endure whatever's ahead of us, what do we do with this? Well, thankfully, we don't have to work too hard at discovering what we should do with it. As the author of Hebrews tells us, two things. Now, they're not easy, but they are two things. First one, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I'm not a golfer. I am very bad at it. I've said this before, if you know me, is, is I golf like once every three years. And from what I know about golf and really anything else, is you probably should do it more often than that if you want to be good at it, Right? So once every three years, and I'm also one of those people, I've talked about this, where I get mad that I'm not uh, incredible at it, even though I never put the effort in to be good at it. But one of the things I know, and why I'm not very good, is because I don't know how to, to, to swing correctly. And so I swing, and then one of the things that happens is, what do they tell you? Any of the golfers, where should I keep my eyes? Look at the ball, because if you don't look at the ball, you're going you're gonna to dip back, you're going to undercut it, you're going to top it, you're going to do something. There's something valuable about paying attention to the ball as you swing through. Same thing at a gym. I, I go to a gym a few times a week, and one of the things that we do is like squats and kettlebell, kettlebell carries and all these different things. And, and every time we lift, we're being reminded that we must keep our eyes up and keep our eyes forward. Because as soon as you start to dip down in what you're looking at, your body's going to get out of whack. You're, you're not going to be in the position you are to have the most strength from the feet all the way through your core and your body. Because there's something important, friends, about where we look that shapes who we are and who we are becoming. It's the same thing about shooting a basketball. We live in this era of basketball that was so shaped by Stephen Curry that every single kid that's trying to learn how to play basketball, they try to play like Steph. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody had any kids that went through and they're like, backward dribbling and shooting shots and you're just like, what are you, you're not even playing basketball, right? They're not looking at the basket and then we're surprised that maybe they never make a shot. Well, the reason is because they're not looking at where they're shooting. Because where we look shapes where we go. And so friends, I can't implore you enough as you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes towards Jesus. One of the things that I discovered in one of my morning times reading through some psalms is this imagery that Tim Tennant, who's the president of Asbury Seminary, talked about. He says, we must develop holy memories. 
we must develop holy memories. Because if we can be honest, sometimes there are moments in our life where we're trying to look forward. There are moments in our lives where we're trying to fix our eyes on Jesus, but it's a little foggy outside the, the front window. There are moments where we're trying to fix our eyes on Jesus, but we just can't see much further than just a few feet ahead of us. And this idea of holy memories is one of the ways I hope that we can refix our eyes on Jesus. Because what a holy memory is, is our ability to go back into our history and say, Jesus Christ, 10 years ago, you showed up in this specific way. 25 years ago at camp uh, in Searcy, Arkansas, Jesus changed my life. And so I can recall this holy memory in my own heart and say, Jesus, you took care of me then. I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of me in the future. Even though I can't see, my holy memory tells me that you are in charge. Even if I don't see you right now, I trust in you. And that's the whole heart of this great cloud of witnesses is many of them didn't get to see the full picture, but they knew they were going to keep going forward because God said he had it. And the last thing I want you to hear from this passage is that it's time for us to get lighter so we can run further. To get lighter so we can run further. This is a really weird image, but Anytime I think about what it means to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, I go to this image from Friends. So I know Friends is probably not a thing that we can talk about in church, but if, if you know, you know, right? So in this moment, what you have is Joey and his roommate, Chandler, rest in peace, Matthew Perry, uh, they are going through a conflict, and it's about clothes, and so Joey, this character right here, he goes and he gets every single piece of clothes that his roommate owns and he puts them all on at one time. And then he says, could I, hey, I'm Chandler, could I be wearing any more clothes? If you're familiar with that. Okay, nobody's a Friends fanatic. Good to know. Just trying to learn my audience, friends. It's only been 12 years. Uh, but I think about that image, and I actually thought about, like, could I even on my own, like, come out here with, like, a robe on and then take the robe off and have another? And I was just like, the, I would be sweating to death, and you would all see me over here and be like, dude, that dude has put on some LBs. Like, I get it. I'm trying, friends. But you know what I'm saying? Like, but that's, it's a ridiculous image, and it made us laugh when it came on. But yet, if we can be real, that's how we live our lives, with layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of all of these things that we hold on to, all of these things that weigh us down, all of these sins that we have not taken seriously enough to begin to cut out or get out of our lives. And, and we live our entire lives weighted down by things that we must get rid of if we want to run the race with endurance. And so friends, I can't encourage you enough today. Maybe it's a sin in your life. And I know we, we live in this era of the church where sin, as soon as you mention sin, people get uncomfortable because we don't actually like to acknowledge that we have broken parts. We don't like to actually acknowledge that there are things that we do intentionally that, that stand in opposition or rebellion of who God has called us to be. But if you want to remove sin from the scripture, friends, you might as well not even have a savior who came to die so that we could have freedom from that sin. So there are sins in your life, things you look at, things you do, things you consume, things you don't do. Those things must go away. And Jesus Christ in his blood, his death and resurrection says, I will give you freedom from that. And I love that the author of Hebrews separates sin and weight. Because the truth in this room is there's also many of you today who have been told about sin ad nauseum. And what you're actually carrying is not like sin, but it's hurt. It's a weight of some moment you had in church 10 years ago and somebody said something or was insensitive or non-caring or not loving and, and you bring that weight in here. And for some of you, it's a weight of a broken relationship that's outside of your relationship with God. 
It's a friend that has hurt you. It's a family member that's struggling, and, and you're carrying that weight, and you're like, God, I don't know. I, I, I just I can't get past this. I can't think of anything different. I'm weighed down by this. It could be a loss that you've experienced. It could be something that's just constantly bothering you, and it's just you can't, no matter what, you can't shake it. It's always there speaking its lies over your heart, trying to tell you that you can't move forward with this thing around your neck. But the truth is, is God says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. You know what he says through Peter in one of his epistles? He says, cast all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Let me reframe that within the context of Hebrews chapter 12. God is for you. He loves you. And he says, you can't carry that weight, but I can. So give it to me your hurt, your baggage, your broken parts, give them to me, I will take care of them and I will bring restoration to your life. Fix your eyes at Jesus, get lighter so you can run further. There's something I, I came across a video and I think we're actually able to play it. In first service, the power just went out in the middle of my sermon which is always a fun experience to have to like panic a little bit. It's like, God, are you displeased with what I'm saying? Like what's happening here? Don't read too much into it. I don't know. Um, but Cody Carnes is a worship leader and, and he was in Rome for some sort of, I don't know, tour or concert or something. And he went to the prison that Paul, like history says, Paul would have written his second letter to Timothy. Timothy was his son in faith. And he's got this video, and, and Janet, you can play it, and, and there's audio behind it, but you don't need the audio. But, but as you can look around in this space, this is the prison. Paul was in prison twice in Rome. The first time he was in prison for like three years, but it was kind of house arrest. Friends could come visit him. He could visit other people. He could get stuff out. He could get stuff in. He was kind of living the good life in Rome at that point, as much as you could under house arrest. But the second time, this is during the the, the Nero, Emperor Nero's uh, persecution of the Christians. This is where Paul is before he is executed for his faith. And as you look at this prison cell, I want you to hear the truth of Hebrews chapter 12. It's the same truth, if you've ever read 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, it's the same exact story. Paul the author of Hebrews, a whole collection of house churches that are together and scared for their lives. And each one of those messages, not single time does Paul say, you should go hide and you should go avoid difficulty and confrontation. No, what he says, he says, I have run the race. I have finished this. And I'm not worried about what lies ahead of me. Because I know what awaits me. This is 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Paul in a prison cell that he can't see anything but a few cracks where there's some bars where he could maybe see some people or hand a letter out so he can get to his, his son in the faith, Timothy. He's, he's sitting in this moment. He says, I will endure all of this because I know that there's a crown of righteousness that awaits me on the other side. The author of Hebrews, who would have been deeply connected to Paul, because at the very end in chapter 13 he says, my brother Timothy, it's somebody connected to Paul who would have been in a very similar spirit, a very similar heart, would have at least carried his yoke if it wasn't Paul himself. In that moment he says, I know things are hard. I know you might be in a prison cell. I know you might have lost this or that or been in some sort of chaotic or challenging and difficult place. But you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And they are cheering you on. And so get up, get rid of the weight and the sin, fix your eyes on Jesus, and keep going. And, and there's a faith, there's a, there's a holiness, there's a goodness to this whenever we take this and make this the reality of our lives where we're not dependent on the situation ahead of us, but we're dependent on where our eyes are fixed. And if you can live that way, friends, Life doesn't get easy. It's not like you live that way and then you're going to go outside and your cars are all going to be 10 years newer and you're going to have a bigger house when you get home and things are going to be awesome. Like it may actually get worse. But if you fix your eyes, you can finish this race the way Jesus has called you to. And it's a, it's a finish, it's a, it's a completion where you yourselves will also receive a crown, a crown of righteousness when you stand face to face with Jesus. So run well, 
get lighter, run further, and fix your eyes on Jesus.